What's up guys? Today we're going to talk about shoulder dislocations. We're going to talk about how these patients will present, what causes this injury, what to look out for on physical exam, what imaging studies do we need to order, and finally I'm going to teach you how to put the shoulder back in place. But before we do, let's quickly go over some anatomy of the shoulder. The shoulder is a naturally very unstable joint. This is because the glenoid cavity is shallow and it's purposely like this to allow a wide range of motion. Furthermore, only a small part of the humeral head articulates with the glenoid in any position. Then you have the glenoid labrum which is a fibrocartilaginous structure that surrounds the glenoid fossa and inserts into the edge of the joint capsule. You also have your glenohumeral ligaments, which help to strengthen the anterior aspect of the glenoid capsule, and the coracohumeral ligament, which strengthens the superior portion. Then you have your four rotator cuff muscles, which provide additional support to the shoulder joint, helping to prevent dislocations. You can remember these muscles by the mnemonic SITS, that's S-I-T-S, where the first S stands for supraspinatus, I stands for infraspinatus, T stands for teres minor, and the second S stands for subscapularis. Finally, you have the axillary nerve which innervates the deltoid and the teres minor muscles. Furthermore, it is the most common nerve injured in anterior shoulder dislocations. So now we know the basic anatomy of the shoulder, what structures aid in its stability, and why it's naturally a very unstable joint. Now let's talk about the most common types of shoulder dislocations and the mechanism behind this injury. The most common type of shoulder dislocations are by far going to be anterior shoulder dislocations. I'll say that again. The most common type are anterior shoulder dislocations, which occur approximately 95 to 97 percent of the time. Posterior dislocations occur about 2 to 4 percent of the time, and inferior dislocations occur 0.5 percent of the time. Since anterior dislocations are by far the most common, that's what we're mainly going to be talking about today. Anterior shoulder dislocations most commonly are caused by a blow to an abducted, externally rotated and extended arm. So abducted, externally rotated, and extended arm. For example, let's say you jumped up to block a basketball shot. Less commonly, a blow to the posterior humerus or falling on an outstretched arm can cause an anterior dislocation. On physical exam, first note the general appearance of the shoulder. An anterior shoulder dislocation will cause the patient to present with the arm slightly abducted and externally rotated. The patient will be guarding the shoulder and resist any type of movement. The acromion will appear prominent in really thin individuals and there will be a loss of the normal rounded appearance of the shoulder as seen in this picture. Next, after you have identified the prominent acromion or lack of, direct your eyes just below looking for any obvious sulcus signs which could appear as a depression in the skin indicating glenohumeral instability. Also, take a look at the integrity of the skin, making sure there are no breaks in the skin that could possibly indicate a dislocated humerus fragment that popped out through the skin and then went back in, indicating a possible open fracture as well. Then take a look at the opposite shoulder, which might help you identify any subtle differences. Next, go ahead and palpate the shoulder. In my typical practice, I start at the level of the sternum and the clavicle. Palpate the entire clavicle, noting any tenderness or step-offs that could indicate a fracture. It is not uncommon for patients to fall on their shoulders and only be complaining of shoulder pain, which is referred from the clavicle. Next, palpate the acromioclavicular, coracoclavicular, and coracoacromial ligaments. Also be sure to palpate the supraspinatus tendon. Increased tenderness in these regions could indicate a concomitant ligamentous or a tendon tear. Then, assess for tenderness in the subacromial space. Palpate this region, feeling for any depressions, which will help you identify the location and direction of the dislocation. You can palpate the glenohumeral ligaments, but pretty much all patients with anterior shoulder dislocations are going to be tender in this region, and it really doesn't help you to determine too much. And finally, palpate the posterior scapula, elbow, forearm, wrist, and fingers, making sure there's no concomitant injury, say from a fall on an outstretched hand. Next, you're going to want to do a good neurovascular exam paying special attention to the distal pulses and function of the axillary nerve, which we mentioned earlier was the most common nerve injured in anterior shoulder dislocations. Ask the patient if they have any numbness or tingling, altered sensation to the shoulder. Axillary nerve dysfunction will present with loss of sensation over the lateral shoulder since it innervates the deltoid and the teres minor muscles. Grab a cotton ball and have the patient close their eyes. Gently brush the cotton ball across the lateral shoulder. Instruct the patient to tell you if the sensation is normal, decreased, or absent each time you brush the cotton ball on a new area of the axillary innervation. Deltoid muscle weakness may be present too, but it is impractical to evaluate when the patient has a true anterior shoulder dislocation because they cannot abduct their arm with full elbow flexion allowing you to press down. In the normal patient with no deltoid muscle weakness secondary to axillary nerve injury, you should not be able to push the arm down. While both axillary nerve and arterial injuries are very rare, 
They occur in a select few of patients. Palpate the axillary, brachial, radial, and ulnar arteries. Look for any obvious evidence of large hematomas or diminished or absent pulses in the setting of increasing pain that could indicate arterial involvement. You will also want to compare the pulses in the unaffected extremity as well. Then you will want to assess range of motion or lack of. This is basically impossible to do in the patient with a true anterior shoulder dislocation. However, you can ask them to gently move their shoulder and document in your chart their decreased range of motion. Complete the rest of your physical exam and history and make sure to ask them when the last time they ate or drank anything. So now we know the most common causes and how to do a good physical exam, but what type of imaging studies do we need to order? Arguably guys, studies show that you don't even need to do x-rays if the clinician is certain of the diagnosis and the patient is less than 40, has had no prior dislocations to the shoulder, and the dislocation wasn't from a traumatic mechanism like a fight or a fall. This is because when these criteria were met, 96.6% .6 of the time, there was no fracture. However, I still believe it to be common practice to get pre-reduction films of the shoulder. You will want to get an AP, scapular Y view, and axillary view of the shoulder as long as the patient can AB duct the arm about 10 to 15 degrees. The definitive diagnosis of anterior dislocations is often very straightforward and it can be easily seen on the AP view. If you're listening to the podcast, you will see the humeral head outside of the glenoid cavity and below the coracoid process, as you can clearly see in this picture. Most commonly, the dislocation will be in the subcoracoid position. If the humeral head lies anterior and underneath the clavicle or glenoid, more commonly referred to as subclavicular and subglenoid anterior shoulder dislocations, this indicates a greater degree of displacement and increases the risk for a greater tuberosity fracture and rotator cuff tears to be present. Make sure to look at all the anatomy as well. Look at the clavicle for any evidence of a fracture, and look at the chest for any evidence of a pneumothorax, maybe secondary to a rib fracture, sustained from a fall. Other associated fractures to look out for include hill sacs deformities, bankard lesions, greater tuberosity fractures, and surgical neck fractures of the humerus. A hill sac deformity is a cortical depression in the humeral head, and they occur in up to 35 to 40 percent of anterior shoulder dislocations and they can be identified best on the AP view. This deformity occurs during the dislocation when the posterior humeral head moves forward and strikes the anterior glenoid, causing a depression in the humeral head. Whereas the Bankhart lesion occurs when during the dislocation, the humeral head moves anteriorly and tears part of the labrum. Only Bankhart lesions occur when the shoulder is anteriorly dislocated and the glenoid labrum is torn or disrupted and pulls a piece of the glenoid bone, causing an avulsion fracture. Other fractures present about 10% of the time include greater tuberosity fractures. After you've confirmed the dislocation on plain films, go ahead and reassess the patient to make sure there's no evolving pathology and the rarely occurring axillary artery injury. Make sure you're adequately treating their pain or anxiety. There are over 16 different methods to reduce an anterior shoulder dislocation, so we're not going over each one. Also, there's no clear evidence to support the superiority of any one method of the many that can be used, so I think a reasonable approach is to use the methods or method in which you are most comfortable with and trained in. So in my typical practice, after I've pre-treated my patient with either IV or IM opioids, inform them about the risks of the procedure and have them sign an informed consent, I attempt to reduce the dislocation without sedating the patient. Before the procedure, once again, I make sure to educate the patient and family members that although he has been treated with opioids, this procedure can be painful. I then further tell them that at any time it becomes too painful, let me know and I will stop. In my personal practice, my initial go-to technique is the external rotation technique. Have the patient lie flat on their back and flex the elbow to 90 degrees while keeping it adducted or close to the body. This will relax the long head of the bicep and allows movement of the humeral head. Then grasp the elbow with one hand and keep them in the adducted position and with the other hand, hold the patient's wrist. Ask the patient to relax the shoulder and forearm, letting it fall to the side and gently externally rotate the forearm. Rotate it gently and slowly over the course of about five minutes until you have the arm externally rotated to about 70 to 110 degrees. If at any time it becomes too painful for the patient, stop rotating it and allow the muscles to relax. If the patient cannot tolerate the pain anymore and asks you to stop, you have to respect their wishes. However, in the patient who is tolerating the pain well and the reduction is not achieved after full external rotation, I typically add in the Milch procedure. To use this technique, begin to AB duct the arm away from the body slowly once more, keeping the arm externally rotated until the arm is in an overhead position. Reduction is oftentimes achieved 
while you have the patient in this position, and you will feel the shoulder suddenly return back into the joint capsule from the pull of the rotator cuff muscles and the external rotators. If while in the overhead position reduction is not achieved, apply gentle traction pulling on the wrist away from the body with one hand in line with the humerus and applying direct pressure over the humeral head inside the armpit using the thumb on your other hand. So in my typical practice, either the external rotation technique alone or combined with the mouch technique pretty much works all the time in the patient who can tolerate the pain. However, for many patients, this procedure is going to be too painful, and in that event, you're going to have to go ahead and sedate the patient. While procedural sedations can be done safely and effectively in the ER, there's numerous things we must consider before sedating and managing the patient, so this really deserves its own podcast in itself. For that reason, if you're interested on how to effectively sedate and reduce anterior shoulder dislocations in the emergency room, be sure to listen to the next podcast because I'll be talking about just that. So in the patient who has had a successful reduction in the ED without sedation, you're going to want to gently and passively move the shoulder, ensuring its function and correct placement. Palpate their pulses one more time and make sure their sensation is normal as well over the axillary nerve. Then place them in a shoulder immobilizer immediately after reduction and a quick re-examination. This is because the most common complication of shoulder dislocations is a recurrent dislocation. Recurrent dislocations occur in approximately 50 to 90% of patients under the age of 20 and only in 5 to 10% in patients over 40. Now once again you could argue that post-reduction films are not necessary. However, I find it to be common practice to confirm the successful reduction and exclude any fractures caused by the procedure with post-reduction films. So go ahead and get your post-reduction films now and confirm the correct placement. Make sure to refer these patients to orthopedics within one week and educate them that they're going to be sore tomorrow and should ice the shoulder, taking Tylenol and Motrin as needed. Well, that's everything we're going to talk about today. Look out for the second part of this lecture on Thursday when we will go over how to effectively, and more importantly, safely sedate and reduce anterior shoulder dislocations in the emergency room. If you have any questions, as always, please email me at gray at physicianassistantboards.com. That's G-R-A-Y at physicianassistantboards.com. Until next time.